What's up everybody, it's Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know, and on this channel we break down the trials and cases you care most about, so you can understand how the American civil and criminal justice system works. And we try to make sure you understand what your rights are in every situation, which is why we try to walk you through the entire legal process while also answering your insightful questions along the way. And while it's not legal advice, it's always exciting. So buckle up for another episode of The Lawyer You Know. What's up, everybody? It's happened. The probable cause affidavit has been unsealed. And that's what we're going to break down today. We're going to dive deep. We're going to go into every word of that document. We're going to talk through in my opinion, with the three biggest pieces of evidence they have against Brian Koberger. We're going to talk about what I think is potentially the single most important piece of evidence for Brian Koberger's team to potentially fight the credibility of, and then also how this is going to be such an expert intensive case. And we're going to see multiple experts and we see in the affidavit them talk about the expertise of some of these law enforcement officers in how they view uh, uh, evidence and how they gather evidence and how they understand evidence. Um, so we are going to go through the entire probable cause affidavit together here in just a couple minutes. Um, what's up, Kim? Welcome as a new member. And Sandra just saw me on WFLA Good Day from Vermont. That's wild. Yeah, I was on with JB earlier talking about this kind of as an overview but I've gotten to dig into it a little bit more since I was on that show. And I'm going to dig into it even more with you as we read it together here live. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and hit that like button if you haven't already, because I know so many of you reached out to me, Andrea, I'll put your super chat back up on the screen in just one second. A lot of you reached out to me here at Tragos law on Instagram and on Twitter, sent me this document, got into the DMS. I appreciate all of that. Um, Jan just said she saw me too. Um, I appreciate all of that so much. You don't understand. I can't respond to all of them. Obviously, I like a lot of them when I see them, especially when a bunch of people are sending me this document. But this is how I get a lot of information. This is how I get a lot of your questions. And I see kind of the vibe that you all are coming at with the questions that you have, whether you think this is strong evidence, weak evidence, whatever it may be. Um, so... You know, I think that it's important to get that vibe kind of coming into the video so we can kind of know what you all want to hear, what you want to talk about, what your biggest skepticisms are for this. Um, RMR Schultz, welcome as a new member as well. So yeah, hit that like button, subscribe to our page, please. We've been doing so much of this content on this case specifically. It is so interesting and there are so many interest interesting legal questions and angles. And one of those legal questions comes on did the FBI actually instruct Indiana police officers to pull over Brian Koberger and his dad? Why would they have done that? Um, why does it make sense? Why does it not make sense? How could it affect the case? Could that evidence be fruit of the poisonous tree? That's a really interesting legal question. We are going to save that for tomorrow. We will talk about that tomorrow. We'll focus on that tomorrow. And I actually think reading through this probable cause affidavit will give us more context when we discuss that tomorrow. So let's make sure we get into... Um, all of those questions and answers on tomorrow's show because we're going to take some time today. Usually these shows are about an hour. We'll see if we can get it done in an hour because it's 19 pages. Um, but without further ado, if you guys have already hit that like button, let's get to it after we answer or after we announce a couple more new members, Vicky, Sheila Camacho, and Andrea. We'll leave this up as we start. Thank you, Andrea, for all the support always. All right, here we go. Hope everyone's ready. All right, let's do this. Exhibit A, statement of Brett Payne. The below information is provided by Brett Payne, who is duly appointed, qualified, and acting peace officer within the county of Leita. Is it Leita? There are so many pronunciations throughout this case that I struggle with. I think it's Leita, but I'm not positive. Um, yes, thank you, Sue. Hopefully we can get to 170K during this video on the 
uh, subscriptions, that would be cool. Um, Brett Payne is employed by the Moscow, not Moscow, police department in the official capacity or position of corporal and has been a trained and qualified peace officer for approximately four years. Corporal Payne is being assisted by the members of the Idaho State Police and agents of the FBI. So he, yeah, Leita. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, he's getting help, which is important. Um, it's important when we talk about the Gonsalves' family talking about how law enforcement did their job, did a great job. I'm interested to see an interview with them and their attorneys. I saw them just outside the courthouse steps. Their attorney said it's very emotional, no comment really from the family at this time. Um, it's just the beginning of the criminal justice process, so we'll keep an eye out to see if they comment after they read through and see this evidence. But yeah, there's a lot of people working on this, as you'll see. A lot of experts, a lot of FBI agents, a lot of uh, local police, and even Pennsylvania police. On November 13th, 2022... At approximately 4 p.m., Moscow Police Department, Sergeant Baker and I responded to 1122 King Road, Moscow, Idaho, hereafter the King Road residence to assist with scene security and processing of a crime scene associated with four homicides. Upon our arrival, the Idaho State Police forensic team was on scene and was preparing to begin processing the scene. MPD Officer Smith one of the initial responding officers to the incident advised he would walk me through the scene. Officer Smith and I entered the King Road residence through the bottom floor on the north side of the building. Officer Smith and I then walked upstairs to the second floor. Officer Smith directed me down the hallway to the west bedroom on the second floor, which I later learned through Zana's driver's license and other personal belongings found in the room was Zana Kernodal, I believe is how you pronounce that, here and after Kernodal's room. Just before this room, there was a bathroom door on the south hallway. As I approached the room, I could see a body, later identified as Kernodal's, laying on the floor. Kernodal was deceased with wounds which appeared to have been caused by an edged weapon. Also in the room was a male, later identified as Ethan Chapin, here and after Chapin. Uh, Chapin was also deceased with wounds later determined. Autopsy report provided by Spokane. So it seems like this potentially, this redacted page, as you can see here, and we talked about that there was going to be certain things that were redacted. Um, and we realized there were going to be certain redactions made here, especially maybe with some of the gory details, some of the autopsy report, some of the medical information. Um, and I believe that's what's been redacted here. I then followed Officer Smith upstairs to the third floor of the residence. The third floor consisted of two bedrooms and one bathroom. We're getting the lay of the land literally of this house. The bedroom on the west side of the floor was later determined to be Katie, Kaylee Gonsalves, here and after Gonsalves' room. I later learned from review of Officer Nunez's body cam, there was a dog in the room when Moscow police officers initially responded. There was a lot of discussion about this dog, right? Why didn't the dog bark? Did they know the person? This person must have been known to the, to the victims because the dog wasn't even barking. A lot of that reporting, right? And we're going to talk about things that were confirmed and were actually true, some of which was very surprising, some things I was very skeptical about that it seems like they actually confirm later in this probable cause affidavit, we'll point that out, other things that were just not confirmed. And that's one of the things we heard. Why wasn't the dog barking its head off? This doesn't make sense. But is that actually true? Let's wait till we hear uh, some of the witness statements. And then we'll also talk about some things that just weren't mentioned until now. Okay. Um, there was a dog in the room. The dog belonged to Gonsalves and her ex-boyfriend, Jack Ducour. I found out from my interview with Jack Ducour that, I'm sorry, on November 13th, 2022. So literally the day this happened, they interviewed Kaylee's ex-boyfriend. And I think that's important because he was ruled out as a suspect very early on. Now we're finding out why they spoke to him very early on. All right. I found out from my interview that he and Gonsalves shared the dog. Officer Smith then pointed out a small bathroom on the east side of the third floor. The bathroom shared a wall with Madison Mogan's here and after Mogan's bedroom, which was situated on the southeast corner of the third floor. As I entered the bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed in the room. Both Gonsalves and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. I also later noticed what appeared to be and here is the big 
exclamation point on the evidence. I said there were three major pieces of evidence. This is piece number one, a tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to Mogan's right side when viewed from the door. The sheath was later processed and had K-A-B-A-R, USMC, U.S. Marine Corps, I assume, and the United States Marine Corps Eagle, Globe, and Anchor Insignia stamped on the outside of it. I'm not sure if we know any military connection with anybody in the Koberger family, um, but that would obviously be something that was interesting. The Idaho State Lab later located a single source of male DNA, suspect profile, left on the bottom snap of the knife sheath. So somebody unsnapped that, left their DNA on the sheath itself. Okay. Later we find out how they're connecting this. One question I get a lot is, can they get Brian's DNA now that they're arrested? The answer to that is yes, they will get his actual DNA. But remember, one of the things that was reported, it was like a genealogy website or 23andMe, how they got him. Well, doesn't seem like that's the case. It seems like the age old trick of law enforcement is how they got this DNA and how they've gotten it so many times before. We will get there. As part of the investigation, numerous interviews were conducted by Moscow Police Department officers, Idaho State Police detectives, and FBI agents. Two of the interviews include BF and DM. Both BF and DM were inside the King Road residence at the time of the homicides and were roommates to the victims. BF's bedroom was located on the east side of the first floor uh, of the King Road residence. So we are about to get to major piece number two, something new that we didn't know, the second most important piece of evidence to come out of this um, probable cause affidavit. The first was the knife sheath. This is number two. And it's going to be the statement of this eyewitness. On the evening of November 12, 2022, Chapin and Kernodal are seen by BF at the Sigma Chi house on the University of Idaho campus at 7.35, Nez, whatever, at approximately 9 p.m. Uh, on November 12th until 1.45 a.m. on November 13th. So they were there for the night hanging out. Uh, BF also estimated that at approximately 1.45 a.m., Chapin and Kernodal returned to the King Road residence. BF also stated that Chapin did not live in the King Road residence, but he was a guest of Kernodal. Boyfriend staying over, right? Any of you, including myself, that have been to college, they understand and remember how these nights go. You go out, you're hanging out at the sorority or fraternity house. Um, you're, you and your boyfriend leave at 1.45 after the party's over, winding down. You go back to your place. Maybe you order food, maybe you eat food, maybe you go to sleep, you know, maybe they stay, maybe they leave, whatever it may be, not an unusual event on most college campuses. So we can track with a lot of this. Logically, it makes sense. It's not like a 50 year old was staying up doing something weird until 4 a.m., you know, peeping out of the window or whatever, right? This is a normal college night. Gonsalves and Mogan were at a local bar. Uh, the corner club at 202 North Main Street in Moscow. Gonsalves and Mogan can be seen on video footage provided by the corner club between 10 p.m. and 1.30 a.m. At approximately 1.30 a.m., they went to a local food vendor called the Grub Truck. We know all this. We've seen a lot of this footage or at least snapshots of this footage. The Grub Truck live streams video from their food truck on the live streaming platform Twitch. So that's interesting, right? How social media is playing into this. And we'll hear more social media platforms mentioned in the future on how they're using that as evidence, which is really interesting to me and how the world and how times are changing. And we better keep up with it. We better understand how all this stuff works. These are public places. Your image could end up live streamed on Twitch if you go to certain food trucks. We just need to know this stuff. I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. I just want everybody to know what's going on around them. And there's nothing wrong with that or illegal about that. The video was captured by law enforcement and a private party reported that he provided a ride to Gonsalves and Mogan at approximately 1.56 a.m. from downtown Moscow in front of the grub truck to the King Roads residence. So about 2 a.m. after they eat, which is a very normal occurrence. It was a, a Whataburger triple all the time in Tallahassee after we would go out late, come home, nothing out of the ordinary at this point. DM and BF both made statements during the interviews that indicated that occupants of the King Road residence um, hold on a second. Uh, 
All right, occupants of the King Road residence were at home by 2 a.m. and asleep or at least in their rooms by approximately 4 a.m. So when we talk about this timeline, there's not a lot that happens between two and four. So they could have just been hanging out at the house. We'll kind of see if more comes in the future in that timeline. This is with the exception of Kernodal, who received a DoorDash order at approximately 4 a.m. And that's important. And here's where we're getting to some of the unknowns, right? 4 a.m., DoorDash order. People are saying, like, did the DoorDash guy see anything? Was the suspect there somewhere close to 4 a.m.? It seems like this was in the timeline of when they think the crimes were committed. So this is, you know, an interesting kind of tidbit of information that we don't really get a ton more from at this point. All right. DM stated she originally went to sleep in her bedroom. And here's where we get to the important evidence from this eyewitness statement. A DoorDash order, Mama Rebel, is like a food delivery. Like they bring McDonald's to your house, but DoorDash is the company that does it. Um, DM stated she originally went to sleep in her bedroom on the south side. And she stated she was awoken approximately at 4 a.m. by what she stated sounded like Gonsalves playing with her dog. Okay. So, so interesting kind of, of things here, right? So Kernodal got a DoorDash at 4 a.m. DM wakes up by what she says is Gonsalves playing with her dog. How you know that that's what that is, is kind of interesting. And we don't really know that, but that's her kind of estimation as I think she was playing with her dog and trial. This may be speculation. She may not be able to testify about this, but for, prop or, uh, for purposes of probable cause, she's allowed to get into this at this point. Um, so they were up on the third floor. A short time later, DM said she heard who she thought was Gonsalves say something to the effect of there's someone here. That is as chilling as I can possibly think of a statement happening in this situation. I have a lot of questions for DM if I am the criminal defense lawyer in this case, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but she thinks she hears there's someone here from Gonzalez. A review of the records obtained from a forensic download of Kernodal's phone showed that this could have been Kernodal. As her cell phone indicated, she was likely awake and using TikTok at approximately 4.12 a.m. So there's another social media site where we can see, we as the public can see if you're on that site and when you're on that site. So Kernodal was on TikTok at 4.12 a.m. So awake. DM stated she looked out of her bedroom but did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house. And this is part of the interesting portion of what we've heard about this house, party house. We saw body cam footage of, you know, a party going on there when none of the people that lived there were actually in the house. So people are coming and going without, you know, one, one roommate can invite 10 people over. The other three roommates might not know. Another roommate can invite somebody different. So this is happening commonly here. Um, DM stated she opened her door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from Kernodal's room. DM then said she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. So what the heck does that mean? It's okay, I'm going to help you. From my perspective, this is kind of a vague statement that we don't really know what this even means. At 417, A security camera located at 1112 King Road, a residence immediately to the northwest of 1122 King Road, picked up a distorted audio. This is wild to think that a security camera from across the way picked up audio of what sounded like a whimper and a loud thud. That's going to be evidence because it's public a whimper and a loud thud. A dog, and here's some of the misinformation that we got, can also be heard barking numerous times starting at 4.17 a.m. The security camera is less than 50 feet from the west wall of the Kernodal's bedroom. It's 
pretty close. But I would think that the dog would actually be barking pretty loudly if you could hear it 50 feet away. So the dog wasn't silent. So all the guesses about, well, it must be somebody they knew because the dog wasn't even barking. Maybe that's not a fact, right? Some things that were reported to us, which is why we kind of want to wait till we get more solid information here. All right, so here we go. I know I, I said earlier, I thought we were getting to the important part, but here's the important part. DM stated, she opened her door for a third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. Chilling, wild, scary. DM described the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows, which I think is an important detail because he's wearing a mask so she can see the bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the black sliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. She did not state that she recognized the male. This leaves, leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. So let's take a time out right here real quick, because this is the second very important and new piece of evidence that came here. Thank you, Sydney, and everybody else throwing these super chats out. We're going to get to a lot of questions here in a bit. So I have a lot of questions about this part. Um, the first question is, this happened at 4.17-ish a.m., right? That's the last timestamp we have up here before we get to the third time she opened the door. So let me just explain to you one way to explain how this happened. She hears someone say, she hears moving up there with Gonsalves thinking she's playing with her dog. She hears Gonsalves say, there's somebody in here. She hears some, some crying. We hear on the camera, which it's weird that DM does not corroborate what we heard on the, the camera, um, a loud thud, after some whimpering, we didn't hear DM state that there was a loud thud, but let's assume there's a loud thud. She then opens the door again, sees a 5'10 or taller male dressed in all black with a mask on, walk down stairs, and she is frozen in shock, which I can totally understand. And then she locks herself in the room and he leaves. When you say it like that, that sounds like a series of events that she could testify to that will be very damning for Brian Coburn. Because he is six foot, 185 pounds. I wouldn't say he's overly muscular, but he is, you know, athletic build. And I would say he has bushy eyebrows, or at least somebody could explain them to be bushy eyebrows. I assume maybe she picked him out of a lineup even. So he fits that description. And anybody obviously could be wearing black with a black mask. Now here's the issue. Five foot 10 athletically built males is probably as average as you can get. That's me. I think that's about JB. You know, we were talking about this on his show. I think a lot of males are five foot 10 or taller even as Koberger is actually taller than five foot 10. So when that description at first may sound just like Koberger, it can sound like a lot of people. That's number one. Number two, you hear all this stuff. You see this person walk out. I assume you could hear him walk out the sliding glass door. You don't go upstairs to check on your roommate. I can understand that. Maybe she's scared. Maybe she's scared that he's still there. Maybe she's scared that he's going out and going to come back in. So that, I think there's an easy answer for why she didn't do that. But then the biggest question out of everything from when I'm reading this probable cause affidavit that I think is problematic or that a defense attorney is absolutely going to dig into is why wait from 4 a.m. to noon to call 911 to report this, to go check on your roommate? I don't think that there's a good answer. I'm not condemning her. She's a young girl at college, doesn't understand maybe the consequences or something that could have happened, or you know maybe she had been out drinking or whatever it may be. But to me, this is going to be a very touchy spot to get through for the prosecution. Because here are some of the questions. Here are some of the questions, okay? Okay. Um, that I would ask her if I was a criminal defense lawyer. And please don't take this as insensitive. I think this is why you guys watch to think about how these cases can play out, how lawyers look at them. And the, the, the truth is they need to prove this beyond a reasonable doubt. We need to be sure this is the right person. We need to be sure the evidence is authentic, admissible, and credible. We have to make sure the evidence is credible. 
And I think that there, there may be a credibility issue here. So here are some of the questions that could be asked of uh, DM. So number one, why not call the cops immediately from your locked bedroom where you at least felt safe enough to stay? And maybe she'll say something like, I was drunk and I was scared because I'm underage or I, you know, I smoked some weed or did some drugs. I didn't want to get arrested or in trouble if I called the cops. So those questions are legitimate excuses, right? Those are legitimate excuses. But if that is her answer, then I think the follow-up question would be, so you were drunk, so you were high. So potentially you might not have seen what you saw, thought you saw. Your memory may be foggy. Um, maybe you didn't see things crystal clear. It was 4 a.m. What were you doing for the previous, you know, seven hours? Okay. I think those will be questions to the credibility and how, you know, legitimate some of what she thought she heard, especially something to the effect of someone's here, something to the effect of I'm going to help you. Don't worry. So, you know, I, I think that creates a credibility issue if that's her answer. But then, so, so Tom N said this, and I asked JB and a couple reporters on WFLA because I don't know this answer. Tom N said, I heard the 911 call information was false data and the call was made right then. I hope that is the case because that would eliminate a lot of these credibility issues that I'm thinking of. But if it was noon, I do think that one of her answers may just be, and I think the defense attorney can again have a field day with this. Um, if she just says, and it may be the truth, right? If she just says it wasn't all that uncommon for a college age dude to be in our house, to be leaving our house at 4 a.m., to be hanging out in our house late after party, watching a movie. Uh, maybe it was a new boyfriend of one of the roommates that she hadn't met yet. Something you talk about maybe in the morning with your friends, you know, in college and not like stop at 4 a.m. and go upstairs after he's leaving and be like, hey, what's going on with that? You know, and I think if you say that, then the defense attorney may be like, then it wasn't anything that was scary, right? So even if it was Brian Koberger that you saw, you didn't see any blood on him. You didn't see any blood on his face or blood on his clothes or he wasn't carrying a knife, right? She didn't say he was carrying a knife or anything like that. So maybe it was just some guy. And even if it was Brian Koberger, maybe it was just some guy hanging out with the girls. I think that that's another argument they could make is she didn't call 911 if she didn't, right? Which is what all the reporting is. She didn't call 911. She didn't go upstairs to see Gonsalves because she wasn't scared and it was normal for people to be around the house at all hours of the night. Hmm. I don't know, Patrick. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I'm just thinking that's very strange to me. That's very strange. And I do think it's something that is going to be fleshed out. All right. Let me answer a few questions here before we get to the next part. Uh, how long has it been? Uh, it's been a little while. All right. Let me see if I can get to run through some of these questions. Uh, Beth, Think we have to give DM a ton of grace. None of us knows what we would do, regardless of the time of day. A thousand other things we want to criticize. This is horrifically scary for DM. I agree with you 100%. 100%. But I also agree that a defense attorney has a job to do and has to make sure the evidence is credible, right? And we have to realize as well that a lot of this going on, sometimes people can hear people talking about things or read news reports and it can affect their testimony as well. And this is part of the legal process. So I hope you don't think I'm being insensitive towards DM. I think it's important. And if, her, if she has a good answer, she may just have a good answer. She may say, I literally was sitting on my floor crying in fear for six hours because I was so afraid he was still there. When I finally got the courage to open up the door and get my phone or whatever it is, that's when I called my 911 and boom, that's a completely credible answer. I don't know what the answer is going to be, but I do think that answer could be important. Aaron, these sheaths are made of leather workers no relation to the actual um, U.S. Marine Corps. So that could just be anybody. I could, you know, write U.S. Marine Corps across my shirt. Um, so I, I, get, I get that, Aaron. Uh, Lauren Hertz, regarding it's okay, or it's okay, I'm going to help you. John W. Gracie used to say the same 
to his critically injured victims before ending them. Oof, read them Bible verses. Mr. Jesse, interesting thing was he was in Clarkson, Washington, later in the day of the murders. That's 30 miles from Pullum and Moscow. There are two rivers that run through Clarkson known for weapons throwing in. Yeah, because that's a big, we're going to get through this affidavit and spoiler alert, they're not going to find a murder weapon. They still don't have the murder weapon at this point. John O'Rourke, we are here to work all the angles with you, Peter. Thanks for the breakdown, my guy. I appreciate it, John. And I know you, as one of the leaders in the chat, we're all respectful here. We're trying to understand this. We're trying to look at this and think critically about this evidence. That's all we're trying to do. And this is a huge piece of evidence. That sheath and this witness statement are huge pieces of evidence that connect Brian Koberger to this. Because a lot of what we're going to read next, a lot of the you know forensic and cell phone and that kind of data, to me, there are going to be experts on both sides that it's very circumstantial. But these are those are the two most important pieces of evidence that we've already read, in my opinion. Trevor. Was this the first time that it was revealed that DM's room was on the second floor and not the first, or did I miss that previously? Trevor, I got to be honest. I'm with you. When they walk through the house and say where rooms are sometimes, sometimes it's hard for me to picture it as well. So I'm not, I'm not positive about that. Uh, common that people are there with a mask on, Patrick. Yeah, I'm not sure. Please keep LEPA uh, defendant all involved in prayers, uh, vicarious trauma. Absolutely, KJAB. I think that's a great comment. Uh, Robin's viewpoint. I think she is going to have a tough road ahead. Lots of questions will be coming to her. I agree. And I hope she has good answers and legit answers of exactly what happened. And, and a scared college student would not be unreasonable. But not dressed in black with a black mask. I, I, I don't know about the mask thing, Tom. And I, there are a lot of people that are still wearing masks, especially with, you know, more waves of COVID coming. I wear a black shirt and black jeans. Um, I don't live in Idaho, but I wouldn't think it was weird to also put a black hoodie on over my black shirt and black jeans. I don't know. Kathleen R. I think there is enough other phone and video evidence to offset DM's questionable credibility. Big picture. This doesn't shed enough doubt. Okay, Kathleen, that's a great comment. And if you were a juror on this case, you would think, I mean, I hope you would need more than what's just in this affidavit, but with that other evidence, you would weigh her credibility. And if it does match up with the other evidence, like we talked so much about in the Depth Be Heard case, you look at the context of all the evidence and you would not think that that was enough reason about, and that's, that's fair. A uh, star sorcerer, yet she was frozen. Why? And that's where I think the credibility where she can't say, well, there was, you know, it wasn't that weird. Cause there was always, you know, people, even college age guys coming in and out of the house at late hours, whatever. Like she can't say that because she said now in the statement that she was frozen with fear. So then it begs the next question. If you're frozen with fear, why would you not, when you locked yourself in the room for safety, I assume, Call 911 immediately. Maybe her phone wasn't in the room. Maybe it was dead. You know, whatever it may be. But questions stack up regardless of what her answer is. Uh, Paley, is it possible they only released a portion of her statement in this affidavit? I guess it's possible. Yeah, because this is kind of like a summary of what she said. We don't see her entire statement. Chances are there is a police report with her entire statement, maybe even recorded. Uh, James, was it a full mask or a COVID mask? I would assume COVID mask since she could see his eyebrows. But again, I don't know that answer. Gloria, this is why, or sorry, this is why my patients often don't report their SAPA. Boom. I agree. There are lots of reasons for delays in reporting, even when it happens to you. I agree with you. I think this is possible. Tom, the sheath has a plastic insert and wrap snaps. That's a $400 US Marine Corps issued knife. I have that exact knife. I have no, I, I'm not a weapons expert. I'm not a military expert. I'll have to take your word for it. I, I don't I don't know. Azam, what does fruit of the poisonous tree even mean? I really want to dive into this deep tomorrow, Azam. So I hope you don't hate me for not giving you a really in-depth answer because we're going to talk about this ton tomorrow. But generally what it means is if the cops do something wrong, they poison that tree. And so any fruit that grows on that tree, meaning every, any evidence they get from doing that wrong act cannot be used. And it's, if it's as if it doesn't exist, it cannot be used at trial. Did DM see blood, uh, Gusto clan? So as I just said, maybe not the full statement here, but I would say since you're trying to get probable cause to arrest this person in another jurisdiction, you're going to put your most important evidence in this probable cause affidavit. It's not just like a quick summary. So if she did see blood on him, I would bet and I would hope it would be in this probable cause affidavit. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Uh, Gloria, fear freezes you and stops clear thinking. All right. Oh gosh, there's still a lot more. They're just flying in. 
Um, do you think lawyers have a chance with what's in the PCA? Felt like a gauntlet as I was reading through uh, 12 pings near home since June. Wow. I actually think as far as these types of heinous crime cases go, there is a lot to work with on the defense side. We'll see if there's more, um, but we'll see. Stacy, I am wondering why the roommates waited eight hours to ring 911, scared drugs, but midday is crazy to me. Uh, will 911 call be released? Thanks, Peter. Love Stacy in England. You were, I have great minds think alike, Stacy. You were, we were literally on the same wavelength there. Uh, Lauren, after reading the surviving roommate's experience, can it be assumed that she will have to testify as a key witness, uh, seeing and hearing killing? Absolutely. Tom N, 911 call was made at that moment. The original information of the time of the phone call was false. Uh, this probable cause affidavit clears that up. Okay, I must have missed that when I read through the first time. I did not hear that she called immediately, um, but I could have missed that. Newish watcher, brand new member, Brittany, what's up? Thanks for your work, Peter. I really look forward to your lives and happy to be part of the Lawyer You Know community. Well, thank you, Brittany. We're pumped that you're here. He could, uh, how could attorney, how could a defense attorney explain away sheath with DNA? We'll talk about that in the future. Uh, Heidi Whistling, can we suspect that he started in Maddie's room since the sheath was found beside the bed? Zana and Ethan were, may have awake and eating. I mean, but the other, but DM was awake downstairs and he just walked by her, which was interesting. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things here that, that don't fully add up, but it would kind of go with what we've been reporting that. Kaylee may have been the target. This would make sense and kind of where you're going. Um, that is possible. Uh, that is possible. I'm not positive though. Uh, Jay Robine said, dude, it's a probable cause affidavit, not a theory of the case or a trial. This isn't evidence. It's a request for a warrant after investigation. Thanks, uh, Jay Robine. Um, I, I would disagree with you that there is evidence here. There is evidence in the probable cause affidavit um, it's not the only evidence they have, and this is not what they go to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, but I think you have to look at it appropriately for how they get probable cause. And I think that if they had more to prove it was Brian Koberger based on the witness statement, then it would be in a probable cause affidavit, as I've seen a lot more in other probable cause affidavits to connect a criminal defendant to a case when they get the arrest warrant. We've actually reviewed some even on, on this, but I appreciate the comment. All right, let's keep reading here. All right. DM stated, where were we? Okay, the combination of DM statements to law enforcement, reviews of forensic downloads of records from BF and DM's phone, and video of a suspect video, video of a suspect video as described below, leads investigators to believe the homicides occurred between 4 and 425 a.m. Uh, during the processing of the crime scene, investigators found a latent shoe print. This was located during the second processing of the crime scene by the ISP forensic team by first using a presumptive blood test and then amino black, a protein stain that detects the presence of cellular material. The detected shoe print showed a diamond shaped pattern similar to the pattern of a Vans type shoe sole just outside the door of DM's bedroom located on the second floor. This is consistent with DM's statement regarding the suspect's path of travel. Corroborating evidence, context. So this stuff is important. Uh, as part of the investigation, an extensive search commonly referred to in law enforcement as a video canvas was conducted in the area of King Road, the King Road residence. This video canvas was to obtain any footage from the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022. In the area of the King Road residence and surrounding neighborhoods in an effort to locate the suspect or suspect vehicles traveling to or leaving from the King Road residence, this video canvas resulted in the collection of numerous surveillance videos in the area from both residential and business addresses. I reviewed numerous videos that were collected and have had conversations with other MPD officers, ISP detectives, and FBI agents that are similarly reviewing, reviewing footage that was obtained. A review of camera footage indicated that a white sedan here and after suspect vehicle one was observed traveling westbound on the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive in Moscow at approximately 3.26 p.m. and westbound on Steiner Avenue at Idaho State Highway 95 in Moscow at approximately 3.28 a.m. On this video, it appeared suspect vehicle one was not displaying a front license plate. A review of footage from multiple videos obtained at the King Road neighborhood showed multiple sightings of suspect vehicle one 
starting at 3.29 a.m. and ending at 4.20 a.m., which is how they get the timelines of the murders between 4 and 4.20 a.m. These sightings show suspect vehicle making initial three passes. So multiple times he's kind of going past um, the house. Based off my experience as a patrol officer in, uh, this is a residential neighborhood with a very limited number of vehicles that travel in the area during the early morning hours. Upon review of the video, there are only a few cars that enter and exit this area during that time frame. So I like how he throws in there, um, based on my experience as a patrol officer, meaning I can put this stuff together. I can testify about this stuff, uh, which is interesting. And he, he's going to get into other people's credentials too that worked on this case. Uh, suspect vehicle one can be seen entering... Uh, sorry, suspect vehicle one can be seen entering the area a fourth time at approximately 4.04 a.m. It can be seen driving eastbound on King Road, stopping and turning around in front of 500 Queen Road, number 52, and then driving back westbound on King Road. When suspect vehicle one is in front of the King Road residence, it appeared to unsuccessfully attempt to park, turn around. The vehicle then continued where it can be seen completing a three-point turn. Suspect vehicle one is next seen departing the area approximately 4.20 at a high rate of speed. Next observed traveling to, um, oh, my camera just went off. Hold on a second. Let me switch cameras here to this camera. All right, backup camera being used. Here we go. Um, sorry about that. All right. Um, High rate of speed, next observed traveling southbound on Walenta Drive. Based on my knowledge of the area and review of camera footage in the neighborhood, that does not show suspect vehicle one during that time frame. I believe that suspect vehicle one is likely ex exited the neighborhood at Palouse River Drive and Conestoga Drive, Palouse Drive, the intersection. All right. Eventually, the road leads to Pullman, Washington, and we know why that's important. Pullman, Washington is approximately 10 miles from Moscow, Idaho. Both Pullman and Moscow are small college towns, and people commonly travel back and forth between them. Uh, law enforcement officers provided video footage of suspect, one, suspect vehicle one to forensic examiners with the Federal Bureau of Investigators that regularly utilize surveillance footage to identify the year, make, and model of an unknown vehicle that is observed by one or more cameras during the commission of a criminal offense. This is background information about how they do this. This is part of their job, part of their expertise, part of what they're going to testify to. Um, the forensic examiner has approximately 35 years of law, law enforcement experience with 12 years at the FBI. Again, expertise, evidence that this person is in fact an expert. Uh, his specific training includes identifying unique characteristics of vehicles, and he uses a database that gives visual clues of vehicles across states to identify uh, the differences between vehicles. After reviewing numerous observations of suspect vehicle one. So they had an expert look at this vehicle. Somebody just said I'm gone. So I'm just making sure I'm still here. He may be a little bit behind. Can you guys hear me and see me? Hopefully. All right. Um, after reviewing numerous observations of this vehicle, the, he initially believed that the suspect vehicle was a 2011 to 2013 Hyundai Elantra. And a lot of what we said uh, and a lot of what we heard, the reports, was it was a 2013 Hyundai Elantra. Turns out it wasn't that. So if a defense attorney wants to kind of grasp at straws and be nit nitpicky, they can say, oh, this guy with 35 years of law enforcement experience, he came up with the wrong data after looking at all that. Is he thought it was a 2011 to 2013. But then it says upon further review, he indicated it could also be a 2011 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. As a result, investigators have been reviewing information on persons in possession of a vehicle that is a 2011 to 2016 white Hyundai Elantra. So we have you know, heard at length about that. And this is, and this to me is the third major piece of evidence in this probable cause affidavit. And when you explain how they use this video evidence to come down to the car that they did, then connecting the car to Koberger, following the track of the car, using the cell phone pings, everything we're about to read and put this together, 
the car is such a huge piece of evidence and they see everywhere that it goes. All right, investigators were given access to video footage on the Washington State University campus located in Pullman, Washington. A review of that video indicated that approximately 2.44 a.m. on November 13th, 2022, a white sedan, which was consistent with the description of the white Elantra, known as Suspect Vehicle 1, was observed on WSU surveillance cameras traveling north on the southeast Nevada Street at approximately 2.53, white sedan, which is consistent with, ve with Suspect Vehicle 1, observed traveling southeast um, towards SR270. Uh, then SR270 connects to Pullman, Washington, to Moscow, Idaho. This camera footage from Pullman was provided to the FBI forensic team. The forensic examiner identified the vehicle observed as being a 2014 to 2016 Hyundai Elantra. Uh, at approximately 5.25 a.m., the sedan, which was consistent with the description of vehicle, suspect vehicle one, was observed on five cameras in, Pol five cameras in Pullman, Washington, and on the campus. First camera recorded the white sedan located at 1300 Johnson Road. The white sedan was observed traveling northbound on Johnson Road. Johnson Road leads directly back to the West Palouse River Drive in Moscow, which intersects with Conestoga Drive. The white sedan was then observed turning north on Bishop Boulevard and northwest on SR270, approximately 527. The white Elantra was observed on cameras traveling northbound on Stadium Way. We have a Stadium Way in Tallahassee at Nevada Street. Uh, Stadium Way at Grimes Way and Stadium Drive at uh, Wilson Road and Stadium Way at Cougar Way, which is the Washington State Cougars, for those of you that don't know. So then we have a picture literally showing where the car, um, or this is Moscow and Pullman. Later we see, yeah, here's where the car went. And they're just showing it goes exactly. This is this is really good circumstantial evidence, in my opinion. Um Really good circumstantial evidence. So those are the three big pieces. His DNA on a knife sheath in the bed, number one, very as close as you can get to a smoking gun, right? Without actually getting the smoking gun. The eyewitness report that loosely identifies him at the right time walking down from the scene of the crime. And then the cell phone slash car data together. Those are the three major pieces of evidence in this probable cause affidavit that we're looking at. Um... On November 25th, MPD asked area law enforcement agencies to be on the lookout for white Hyundai Elantras in the area. Here we go. So this was another interesting piece of information that I don't feel like, um, that I don't feel like we knew about. It was kind of a surprise when I read this. On November 29th, 2022, at approximately 12.28 a.m., Washington State University Police Officer Daniel Tiengo queried white Elantras registered at WSU. As a result of that query, he located a 2015 white Elantra with a Pennsylvania license plate LFZ8649 registered to Brian Koberger, hereafter referred to as Koberger. So they had Koberger as a potential suspect and there may have been other suspects, right? So, but I'm just talking about how law enforcement continued to go with, we don't have any suspects. The family was frustrated. Um, a lot of people were, were, uh, frustrated with, you know, how slow the process was or how they didn't have any suspects or they wouldn't even say it was a male was one of the complaints that we got. Well, back on November 29th, which is, you know, just over two weeks after the crime was committed, they were looking into Brian Coburn. Um, he's three quarters of a mile of away from the intersection of stadium way and Cougar way. So the same day at approximately 1258 AM, uh, Washington State University officer Curtis Whitman was looking for white Hyundai Elantras and located 2015 in the Pullman parking lot at an apartment complex that houses WSU students. Officer Whitman also ran the car and it returned Koberger uh, with a Washington tag. I reviewed Koberger's Washington State driver's license information and photograph. His license indicates that he's a white male, six foot 185, which loosely matches the description that DM gave, which I think is going to be hugely important. Additionally, the photograph of Koberger shows that he has bushy eyebrows. You can see that in his driver's license, I guess. I, I, I would kind of agree with that, right? If I'm looking at him, I, I would say he has bushy eyebrows. I think you could say I possibly have bushy eyebrows as well. So I think that, you know, that's not a cut, but I think that would be a descriptive way um, to describe his eyebrows or an appropriate way to describe his eyebrows, I should say. 
Koberger's physical description is consistent with the description of the male DM saw inside the King Road residence on November 13th. So they knew this back on the early morning hours of November 29th, 2022. I thought that timing was pretty interesting. Further investigation, including a review of Latah County Sheriff's, Depart uh, Sheriff's Deputy Corporal Duke's body cam and report show that on August 21st, prior to this incident, Brian Koberger was detained as part of a traffic stop that occurred in Moscow, Idaho. Traffic stop in Idaho is interesting. Um, by Corporal Duke. At the time, Koberger, who was the sole occupant, was driving the 2015 Elantra with that plate set to expire on November 30th. During the stop, um, Koberger provided his phone number and we'll, we'll just leave the 8458 because that's how they know what his phone number is and they were able to get access to his phone and ping stuff like that, um, which is you know always interesting. And his cellular telephone number, investigators conducted electronic database queries and learned that 8458 phone is a number issued by AT&T. And here's how they make the steps, right? So really good investigation so far. I feel like they're really laying out the timeline, how they got everything, where they got everything. This is way more evidence than you need for probable cause to an arrest. So I, I definitely think it was, it was there, but I, again, I hope there's more uh, before we take this to a, a capital potential trial here. Um, on October 14th, he was detained as part of a traffic stop WSU upon review of the body cam. He was the sole occupant of the Elantra on November 18th. Now we are after the crimes, according to Washington state licensing, Koberger registered his Elantra with Washington and later received the Washington plate. So a lot of people were making a big thing about him changing his plates while he was pulled over twice while his plate was about to expire on November 30th. Somebody said his birthday was November 21st or something like that. And, um, so this is, I mean, he's going to have an explanation as to why he changed his plates, not just to evade law enforcement potentially. <clears throat> Based on my own experience in communication with law enforcement, I know that Idaho and, and Washington require front and back license plates to be displayed. Investigators believe that Koberger is still driving the 2015 white Elantra because this vehicle was captured on December 13th by a license plate reader in Loma, Colorado. Information provided by a query to a database. Koberger's Elantra was then uh, queried on December 15th, 2022, when law enforcement in Hancock County, Indiana. Boom. There is the stop that we're going to be talking about tomorrow. But guess what? That's it. That's all they really say about the stop. So how much evidence did they actually get from the stop? That's going to be one of our punchlines to tomorrow's video. Um, it does not say the FBI told them to. It does not say that the FBI um, got information relayed to them from this Hancock County police officer. None of that's in here. It just says, we still think he was driving it because a plate reader picked him up in Colorado. Law enforcement saw him in Indiana. And then on December 16th, uh, they showed him in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. It was just a stop along the way, basically. The sole occupant of his vehicle was a white male whose description was consistent with Koberger. Koberger has family in, uh, it doesn't say he was by himself in Indiana, but uh, Koberger has family in Albrightsville, uh, Pennsylvania. Learn through a TLO search and locate tool database database. Corey, it's important how they find all this stuff, right? It's important. All right. Uh, based on information provided by uh, WSU website, Coburg is a PhD student in criminology uh, at Washington State. Pursuant to records provided by a member of the interview panel for Pullman Police Department, we learned Coburg's past education includes undergraduate degrees in psychology and cloud-based forensics. I could have missed that, but I don't remember seeing that he is, um, you know, he has experience with cloud-based forensics. That's pretty interesting to me. Um, you guys tell me what you think. Uh, these records also showed Koberger wrote an essay when he applied for an internship with the Pullman Police Department in the fall of 2022. So when we were talking about this before, I said his education sounds more like he was interested in law enforcement more than law. When people were saying, you know, he's going to represent himself and things like that, he may, but again, it didn't seem like he was on the law path. Um, Koberger wrote in his essay that he had interest in assisting rural law enforcement agencies with how to better collect and analyze technological data and public safety operations, which is literally exactly what they did in this case. Koberger also, and here's where my mind was kind of blown, right? 
because I'm kind of a hater sometimes on what we find on TikTok and Reddit and, you know, some social media posts. I'm always like, can we believe it? I'll wait till it's authenticated. I'll wait till law enforcement corroborates it or till it comes out as evidence. Well, in the probable cause affidavit, Koberger also posted a Reddit survey that we looked at together. I talked to some people on DMs on Instagram about this, a Reddit survey, which can be found by an open source internet search. This survey asked for participants to provide information to understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision-making when committing a crime. And that is what the Reddit post said. I saw it myself. I just didn't necessarily know how legit it was. Um, but that is very, very interesting. Yes, let's hit 170K in this light, in this live, Robin. Thank you. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you guys haven't already. We're going to be breaking this case down. And we dive deep in a lot of the cases that are going on. We've got a Sarah Boone trial coming up, an Alec Murdoch trial coming up. Valo Daybell over in Idaho is happening as well as this case. So if you like this type of content and you want to be a part of picking what content we do in the in on this channel, hit that subscribe button. We'd love to have you. And I am going to be getting to more questions here. Let me just get through a little more of this. As part of this investigation, law enforcement obtained search warrants to determine cellular devices that utilized uh, cellular towers in close proximity to the King Road residence on November 13th, 2022, between 3 and 5 a.m. So they obtained a search warrant. That's important to make this stuff admissible. And then it's cellular towers in close proximity. We've used this and we've seen this used in other cases. And there is some differing opinions on how experts look at cell phone pings and use of cell towers and use of locating people based on this information. This is not to say that his cell phone was in or around this King Road residence, right? I should say in it or outside the, the front door. It does mean it was in close proximity. So let's just keep that in mind as context as we continue reading. After determining that Koberger was associated uh, to both, what happened? Oh, I don't want that up there, John. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we're, we're close to 170 K. That was the real time counter. So if you haven't hit the subscribe button, hit it when we get really close, maybe when we get to like five away from 170 K, maybe we can put that, put that up there. Oh, duty Ron's in the chat. What's up, duty Ron. It's hard for me to watch this chat while I'm reading at the same time. So I apologize if I missed anything, but I am going to get to a lot of the questions here once we're done reading through this. Um, After determining that he was associated with the Elantra and the 8458 phone, investigators reviewed these search warrant returns. A query of the phone returns did not show the phone using cellular tower resources in close proximity to the King Road residence between 3 and 5 a.m. Seems like a big win for um, Koberger, right? His cell phone didn't ping during the hours that this was happening. Based on my training and experience and conversations with law enforcement officers that specialize in the utilization of cell phone, uh, cellular telephone records as part of investigations, individuals can either leave their cellular telephone at a different location before committing a crime or turn their cellular, tel cell cellular telephone, telephone, I'll just say cell phone, off prior to going into a location to commit a crime. This is done by subjects in an effort to avoid alerting law enforcement that a cellular device associated with them was in a particular area where a crime is committed. So he's explaining why this isn't an alibi. I also know that on numerous occasions, subjects will surveil an area where they intend to commit a crime prior to the date of the crime. Very smart. So he's saying, we're not just going to limit it to 3 to 5 a.m. on this day. Was he smart enough to turn his cell phone off every time he came in this area? Did he come in this area for a long time before he even knew he was going to commit this crime so he wouldn't have thought to shut that off? Very interesting. All right. Um, all right, depending on circumstances, this could be done a few days before or for several months prior to the commission of a crime. During these types of surveillance, it is possible that an individual would not leave their cellular telephone at a separate location or turn it off since they don't plan to commit the offense on that particular day. So he's saying, if we can find it on these other days, sometimes that's even more of an indication that this person did it and tried to kind of throw us off by turning off their phone when the crime was actually committed. 
On December 23rd, 2022, I applied for and was granted a search warrant for historical phone records between November 12th and November 14th from 12 a.m. to 12 a.m. for that phone. Here's what's interesting here, a little, a little behind the scenes. So the reason he didn't initially get it from November 12th to November 14th and, a, and he got a more um, uh, locked in, a more, a, a more narrow request the first time is because when you do these warrants, they don't, they shouldn't be overly broad. We care about people's privacy rights, right? Even if we think they committed crimes, we care about people's privacy rights. So when this law enforcement officer first applied for the warrant, he tried not to make it overly broad. He said just the hours the crime was committed. But then when he didn't get the pings on those hours, he said, well, let me apply for another warrant here because there is a lot of indication and evidence from other cases that they'll actually turn it off in order to try to throw us off. So give me just a little bit more. And at this point, he's not getting six months worth of data. He's getting two, or two days worth of data. So that means that the, they, they found that there was enough justification for this warrant for these two days to see if he stalked or tracked or surveilled the home before committing the crime. December 23rd, pursuant to the search warrant, I got records and um, the phone that is connected to Koberger and that address and the account since June 23rd, 2022. These records also indicate a historical cell site location information for the phone. After receiving this information, I consulted with FBI special agent that is certified as a member of the cellular Anal analysis survey team more expertise here by the FBI agents. These people will be testifying at trial if it gets there, in my opinion. Uh, members of CAST are certified with the FBI to provide expert testimony in the field of historical CSLI and are required to pass extensive training that includes both written and practical examinations prior to being certified with CAST, uh, as well as the completion of yearly certification requirements. Additionally, the FBI CAST SA and uh, or that I consulted with has over 15 years of federal law enforcement experience, which includes six years with the FBI from information provided by cast. I was able to obtain estimated locations for the phone on November 12th and November 13th, the time period authorized by the court, which the court found that it was, um, appropriate for those days. All right, let's pause here for a second. Let me get to some of these answers. So we'll throw up some of the new members on the screen. We'll throw up. We're not going to throw up, hopefully, but we'll put the some of the new members on the screen here as we're continuing to read. John, you can cycle through those so we can get some recognition for those new members once I start reading again. Uh, Kathleen R. Interesting to hear your thoughts as a defense lawyer versus EDB as a former prosecutor. Yeah, it's cool to get different perspectives always. And I actually worked as a prosecutor as well, so I like to see it from both sides if possible. Alexandra Hernandez. Is it crazy that he'd never been questioned by the police and he had no idea they were on to him? Do we know he had no idea? I don't know. Uh, zippity doo -wop. The path that the Elantra took based on the cell phone GPS and video after the murders was so out of the way that he likely ditched the weapon at that point. You would think they tracked back there, right? Uh, somebody else commented that there's like rivers famous for throwing weapons down them and maybe you can't find them once you throw weapons in there, but it is interesting. And we'll see what he says about the route that he took. I think there's something in this affidavit about that. Uh, millennial me 911 call was regarding unconscious person could have been the roommate. Yes, it could have Tom N when the judge reads the charges and the victims in an order, does this have anything to do with the order in which they were carried out? Not necessarily. Sometimes there is a primary victim. We'll say, I don't think we have that yet in this case, <clears throat> Amy McIntyre. Can she identify him in this case? I think she is going to have to. Um, maybe she'll identify his eyebrows or him by just his eyes or something like that. I don't know if she did a lineup or a photo lineup or anything like that. Michelle C. Could the police have done alcohol and drug tests on their surviving roommates? I would doubt it, but I wanted to ask. Um, they could have. I don't know if they did. Um, I would have said no to that if I was one of the roommates because I would have been like, no, why? John, actually don't do that. Just focus on getting the comments and starting the questions. I'll go back at the end and we'll recognize all the new members um, and super stickers like Cheryl. Appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Kimberly. Times two for Kimberly and Kathy. It's awesome. You guys are the best. All right, a couple more questions here. Uh, Twizzler 6, school started 822. That's interesting in the timeline. 
John O'Rourke. I think the most important info in this report is the white vehicle location. That's why it's the majority of the report. I think a good DA, uh, good RIP, a, a could rip apart the sheath evidence depending on the type of DNA found. This is a peri crib. I don't know what a peri crib is. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot to work with for the prosecutors, a lot to work with, and a storyline that makes sense with the timeline and the mapping out of where the car and cell phone went. P Hop, I'll have to be on rewatch crew, join late, work interruptions during a live, should be against the law, but I know a lawyer. P Hop, please get in the comments when you watch it, when you rewatch it. I want to hear what you think. Mo, I think the defense still has a lot to defend here. The state has a lot or has to prove that, in fact, was him in the car on that day, not someone using his vehicle and using a knife found in his car. Right. And I think that's why the witness statement and his DNA on that sheath are so important. And all three major pieces of evidence work together. Where I disagree with that comment that said there's no evidence in here. Um, this isn't showing what the evidence is in the case. I think this is showing what the evidence is in the case. I don't think we have a full theory of the case or how they're necessarily going to put it all together. But I think with the evidence, you can think of different theories of how that evidence can be used and how it can be argued against. Uh, Linda Sue, the police were very close to the victim's house uh, the night of the murders, talking to the boys in the park. Perhaps BK saw the flashing lights through the window. He had to get out of there fast. Interesting. Well, we're going to find out. He actually goes back, which is pretty wild. Alyssa Hendry, the DNA matching from the trash, the family home and 2,500 miles away is going to be hard. Also, they ping cell phone on 12C, other miles at location. Thoughts? Oh, yeah. And we're going to get to that. We're, uh, hold on. Let me, I'll keep this one up there. I thought you were reading at one point. I think you're reading at 1.25 speed cat yard. Sorry. I try to, I try to get through as much information as I possibly can, but I'm, I'm willing to go a little overtime today because this is important. Uh, Beth, thanks for being fair, Peter. I, I always try to right, And I, I can understand if people think that, um, I am insensitive and I can understand that. Tell me when you think I am and I'll try my best not to be okay. I, I do try to give it to you real, like how this stuff is going to be scrutinized in court because it is and how both sides will use this evidence because they will. So I, I do think that's an important part. I think that's why you're here, right? I don't think you guys just list, like listening to me reading a piece of paper. Most of you guys could read this on your own, I think. Um, but I think that's what we like to discuss here. And I am here to get your questions and your input on it because I love it. Uh, John O'Rourke, remember they don't have a murder weapon. Could the murder weapon fit that sheath? And this is what I, I was talking about this on JB's a little bit. I'd be willing to bet the medical examiner and the experts they have look at the, the wounds to the bodies are going to be able to match how long and what type of a weapon would be used with some measurements. They can measure the sheath and they can say, this sheath fit the weapon that made this wound. And they'll be able to connect those dots. Now, I think the defense will be able to get experts that could potentially poke some holes in that. And I've heard the defense already has an expert that's kind of recreating the scene to show how maybe this couldn't have been one person. Maybe it had to be somebody with more training than, than Brian had. Who knows? Um, size, width, length of knife. Exactly. We're on the same page there, John. There were hundreds of different DNA in the house everywhere thinking outside the box. I agree, which is why that sheath is so important because the layered DNA and people coming in and out, you think about it's a stairwell. So if there's a handle, hundreds of DNA of different people's DNA would be on that handle or on the door handle or shoes walking. I mean, vans, how many vans could have pro probably walked across that carpet, but the sheath and the DNA on the sheath, huge, huge piece. Peter, as with EDB, please take care of yourself. You've probably seen horrid things and you are still human. So possible triggers prayers. I, I appreciate that. And I understand. I, I actually think talking about it and understanding um, this stuff together helps and is helpful and helps keep me grounded, right? If I do start to get a little callous to some of this stuff, you guys do help keep me grounded because it is what I do every day. And I work with, and I work on injury cases now, you know, on victims of wrongful death and personal injury cases. And we deal with horrific details and injuries and things that happen to people. So I appreciate that. Uh, Denise Glads. I just told my son, I can't make dinner because the lawyer, you know, is still talking on TV right now. I will try to, I'll try to pick up the pace here. Uh, pulled over to document hand wounds. They don't have any of that in here, right? They didn't put any of that in the probable cause affidavit, which doesn't mean they might not use it later. Um, we'll talk tomorrow about whether those wounds on his hands could possibly be fruit of the poisonous tree. Uh, Lily is the boss. Maybe it was a COVID mask. Possible DM thought he was a roommate's friend, started at first, went uh, back to bed wearing noise-canceling headphones, which would be common with noisy roommates. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of things, right? There's a lot of explanations. I just don't know what the explanation is, and I think it will be questioned, as insensitive as that may seem. 
I think it will be questioned. Uh, Linz, him going back not long after the murders is so disturbing. And let's get back to the document, Linz, so we can get to that part. Thank you, Melanie. All right, here we go. On November 13th at approximately 2.42 a.m., cell phone was utilizing resources that provide coverage in Pullman. So at 2.42, he pinged in Pullman. Here and after the Coburger residence. At approximately 2.47, it provided coverage southeast to the Coburger residence consistent with 8458 phone leaving the Coburger residence and traveling south through Pullman. Uh, this is consistent with the movement of the white Elantra. Again, so they're matching up. And my guess is at trial, we can have a map where, you know, it shows cell phone pings and uh, where the car goes. I don't think that's what that other map was there, but it could have been. Um, at approximately 247, the phone stops reporting to the network. I'd be interested, right? Because I live in Tampa. A lot of you live in big cities. How's the cell phone in Moscow, Idaho? Is it normal to not have cell phones pinging? Or is this for sure he turned it off? Could that be an argument for the defense? I don't know. I just don't know what the what the uh, service is like out there. Um, the connection to the network disabled, is disabled, such as putting the phone in airplane mode or the phone is turned off. So they're saying he disabled the, the cellular service that would have been pinging. The phone does not report to the network again until approximately 448. So that is evidence in itself, right? It stops pinging from 247 to 448. When do we think the crimes were, were committed? Between 3 and 5 a.m or I think it was actually a shorter period of time, but that's where they, the first warrant was from 3 to 5 a.m. for the cell phone service. Nope, the cell phone service between WSU and Moscow is excellent, somebody said. I lost it. And Jade, it's excellent. Service is good in town. See, I love having locals in here. I mean, in some of these other cases, like the Daryl Brooks case, all of the locals there that made added so much context to what we were talking about. And a lot of people have messaged me saying, I'm here to add context if you need it. And I love when people get in the chat and in the comments, um, uh, add context to this. It's so helpful. Cause again, like I said, I'm not in Idaho. Um, all right. Reported back at 448. It util utilized cellular resources that provide coverage, um, South of Moscow near Blaine, Idaho, North of Genese or Genesee, uh, between 450 and 526. Uh, it was on highway 95, another place in Idaho, and then back to Pullman approximately 530. The phone is utilizing uh, resources that provide coverage to Pullman and consistent with the phone traveling back to the Coburger residence. If he takes the stand and testifies, he's going to have to answer as to why the Elantra and cell phone went to all these places at these hours of the night. He could say it wasn't me. I wasn't there. Um, he could say a lot of things about that, but it'd be interesting to hear how he came up with answers for this. Um, all of this is consistent with him traveling back to the Coburger residence. His movements are consistent with the movements of the white Elantra that is observed traveling north on Stadium Drive at approximately 527. Um, travel is consistent with that of the white Elantra. Further reviewed, utilized cellular uh, resource on November 13th, um, leaving the Coburger residence at approximately 9 a.m. And this is the, the creepy part here. And traveling to Moscow, Idaho. Specifically, it utilized the cellular resources that would provide coverage to the King Road residence which doesn't mean he was in there or right there, but it was close enough to this is the tower that would ping if you were inside the house between 912 and 921. And this is on November 13th. So just five hours after. And that would be like, how do you have an answer for that, Brian Koberger? How do you have an answer? You were there, you were pinging right around there, leaving that area at, what was it? 4.50 in the morning? Yeah, 4.50 in the morning. And then at nine o'clock, you were back heading that way. It's weird. Now, I don't think he was going to go back in the house and retrieve the sheath, especially if he saw the roommate on his way out. Um, but who knows? A lot of times we've heard how people go back and, you know, want to look at the crime scene. My guess is, and this is total rank speculation, so don't take this anywhere, but he probably thought there was going to be law enforcement there at that point, right? I mean, if you see a roommate as you're leaving, doing what you just thought or what you just did, whoever it was, whether it was him or not, and you come back there to see, he was probably shocked that there was no law enforcement there if it really was not reported until noon. Um, and then he traveled back to his residence at 9.32 a.m. So a short trip there to just kind of see what was going on. Very strange. 
Below is a depiction, not to scale, of the possible route taken based off the cellular site and locations. So here it is, a very roundabout way, which somebody commented earlier. Um, there are some rivers here, I think, along the way that you can ditch a murder weapon in. Again, speculating, but who knows? Investigators found that the phone did connect to a cell tower that provides service to Moscow, Idaho on November 14th, but they don't believe the phone was in Moscow on that date. That's weird. Why? Uh, they did connect it to the tower that provides service there, but they don't believe it was there. That's weird. I, I don't, I want to know why. I'm not a cell phone expert. I've hired them before. That's a question I would ask in a deposition. Why? Uh, the phone has not connected to any towers that provide service to Moscow since that date. So since that date going forward, well, what about before? What about before this happened? Did he surveil the area? Did he stalk the area? Was he ever there before? Based on my training experience and the facts of the investigation thus far, I believe Koberger, the user of that phone, was likely the driver of the white Elantra that has observed departing Pullman in the vehicle. Additionally, the route during the early morning and the and the and the lack of the eight four five eight phone pinging between two forty seven and four forty eight is consistent with him his attempt to conceal his location during the quadruple uh, homicide that occurred in the King residence. So, I mean, these are theories; these are motives, right? That comment that said they don't think any of that is in this because it's just a probable cause affidavit. I disagree. On December 23rd, 2022, I was granted uh, a search warrant for Koberger's historical CSLI from June 23rd, which was the day I think he got that phone to the current uh, perspective location information and a pen register slash trap and trace on the 8458 phone to aid in an effort to determine if Koberger stalked any of the victims in this case prior to the offense, conducted surveillance on the King Road residence, was in contact with any of the victims associates before or after the alleged offense, any locations that may contain evidence of the murders that occurred on November 13, 2022, the location of the white Elantra registered to Coburger, as well as the location of Coburger. So are we going to get connections between the suspect and the victims? Because that's something that I've really been waiting to see. Are there connections? On December 23rd, pursuant to that search warrant, he received the historical data. From the time the account was opened, June of 2022, they were able to determine estimated locations for the 8458 phone from June 2022 to the present, the time period authorized by the court. And the records of the phone show and provide coverage of that area to the King Road residents that he was pinging in that area on at least 12 occasions prior to November 13, 2022. That's a lot. That's a lot of times, but based on things we've previously read, they already said his cell phone pinged on one of these towers, but they don't believe the phone was there. I would ask them why and why that's different from all of these. And they may have an answer for that, but it's just interesting. And I think a defense expert may say, if you think there are other ways the phone can ping, but not be there, we think these 12, it could ping and not be there or whatever, have some kind of explanation. We'll see. One of these occasions on August 21st, 2022, uh, providing coverage of the King Road residents, uh, sorry, his cell phone utilized cellular resources, providing coverage to the King Road residents from approximately 1034 to 1135 PM. So that's an hour he was there potentially. At approximately 1137, Koberger was stopped by the County Sheriff's Department. I mean, think about how wild this is. Just a few months. And they, somebody commented that school started on August 22nd. And this is when he got pulled over August 21st. But wild to think that he was there right before school started. What's going on? It's very strange. And he was using it uh, during the traffic stop, so we knew he was there. So that's interesting. So we know where he was stopped, right? It doesn't say where he was stopped, but we could see where he was stopped in Lataw County. How close was he to the residence? That's a question I would have, because like, how wide is this circle where it's pinging? Interesting. All right, further analysis of the cellular data provided showed uh, his cell phone utilized cellular resources on November 13th, consistent with the phone traveling from Pullman to Idaho. At approximately 1236, the phone utilized cellular resources that, that would provide coverage to Kate's Cup of Joe Coffee. Um, surveillance from the Uf U.S. Chef's store located at 820 Drive in Washington, adjacent to Kate's Cup of Coffee, shows the white Elantra, consistent with the vehicle. 
Uh, approximately 1246. He then utilized cellular data in the area of the Albertsons grocery store. Um, so this is just, they're pinging his phone that entire day. Basically, uh, it shows him walking through the store, purchasing unknown items, and then leaving at one Oh four possible path of travel is indicated below. Additional analysis of the records indicated that between 532 and 536, the phone um, utilized cellular resources that provide coverage to Johnson, Idaho. Uh, the phone then stops reporting to the network for from approximately 536 until 830. Why? It's consistent with the phone being in the area, traveled in the hours immediately following the suspected time the homicides occurred. Interesting. On December 27, 2022. So here we go. Here's the last question. How'd they match the DNA? It wasn't from 23andMe. Agents recovered trash. The age old question of trash. Is that admissible? Is that a violation of your fourth amendment right to unreasonable search and seizures? If law enforcement searches your trash and gets your DNA from your trash. Arguments have been made that it's abandoned. It's public. But then again, people are not allowed to go through your trash. It's actually a crime to go through and steal somebody's trash in some jurisdictions. So there is some arguments here, uh, fruit of the poisonous tree, but usually trash is considered something that law enforcement officers can go get DNA from. Um, but we can dig into that more later, probably another video, not today. On December 28th, sorry, uh, trash from the Coburger family residence in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, that evidence was sent to the Idaho State Lab for testing. So sent from Pennsylvania to Idaho so Idaho could do the testing. On December 28th, the Idaho State Lab reported that a DNA profile obtained from the trash and the DNA profile obtained from the sheath, that's important, the trash and the sheath, that's what we're connecting, identified a male as not being, this is a nice complicated way of saying it, a male as not being excluded as the biological father of the suspect profile. That means... They could not exclude Brian Koberger as being the suspect and his dad as being the father of the suspect based on the dad's DNA. At least 99.998% of the male population would be expected to be excluded. So most all of us dudes would be expected to be excluded if they tried to do this DNA match with us and Brian Koberger's dad. So there's only like a 0.0002% chance that this was you know, a screw up. And that's enough for a probable cause affidavit to prove that this was him on the sheath that was with the murder weapon in the bed at the time the crime was committed. And he matches the description of the eyewitness. So there's a lot of evidence stacking on top of each other here. Based on the above information, I am requesting an arrest warrant to be issued for Brian C. Koberger, uh, date of birth 112194 for burglary at... Uh, 1122 King Street in Moscow, Idaho, and four counts of murder in the first degree for the murders of Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonsalves, Zana Kernodal, and Ethan Chap Chapin. Chapin. Whew. Okay, and that was done on 12-29-2022, really not that long ago, right? And now it's been unsealed, and here we are. 8,000 people in the chat. I really hope all of you have subscribed to our page. Oh, yes, here we go. So we'll add this to the stream since I'm done reading. And we'll see if we can get to 179K on this live while we answer questions here because we've got a lot more questions. A mistake on, do uh, on document. Uniontown, not in Idaho. It's in Washington. Interesting, Alexis. Look at that keen eye because I wouldn't know that. Uh, would you see blood all over black? Jamie Kaiser, not necessarily. And I think that's the point. Will we find out whether there was blood, whether there was not blood? or whether she just didn't see it or she freaked out and she was in shock. She didn't notice it, locked herself in her room. All right, we're working our way up right now. Keep them coming. John O'Rourke, does the prosecution have 14 days to present all their discovery because the first trial is on the 12th of January? So no, even a speedy trial would be, oh, wow, we hit it already. That's awesome, guys. Appreciate it. The next giveaway is going to be at 175K, so we'll see how quickly we can get to that. This was cool to hit a milestone on a stream is always fun. Um, does the prosecution have 14 days to present all the discovery? No, no, they're going to have more time than that. Uh, and that's the first hearing date, I believe would be on the 12th. It's probably his arraignment where he reads the charges against him and some of the evidence against him, but not all discovery. Alexis Kingsley, let's not victim blame. MD could have had a bad trip. It's not uncommon to hallucinate and convince yourself it's not real. 
she also could have locked the door and immediately passed out. I agree. I, I am not trying to victim blame at all. I, I don't think the chat was either. And I hope um, it wasn't. Uh, I, I just am saying those questions are going to be asked of her throughout this case. Ashling, really loving your coverage and viewpoint on this case, Peter. Thanks for going through all this with us. It's not an easy one. It's actually miserably hard. This one is really, really, really tough. Really tough and will continue to be tough. Congrats on 170K. Thank you so much, Nicole. All right, let's talk about some of these new members. Gregory Lawrence, welcome to the crew. Lori Z is a new member. Kay Kraut, I think was a member before and is now back. Uh, CLV USMC. Very cool. Thank you for your service. If you serve, there's somebody in your family serve. Uh, Jennifer Kaplan, welcome. Susan Christensen. Robin Knapp is a new member as well. Connie Cordry is a new member. Sarah Horn. Mariah T. Jennifer Bossert. Robert Leversk. All right, Alyssa, let's get to this question again. The DNA matching from the trash at the family's home in 2,500 miles away is going to be hard. I don't know what you mean by, it may be hard to overcome by him. If that's what you're saying, I agree with you. Also, they pinged the cell phone on 12 other times at the location thoughts. That's big, I think. If he has no other, and, and again, so we read this entire probable cause affidavit together, right? And there are some things that aren't in here. And things that happened after the arrest, right? They got his Elantra inventory search, search of the vehicle. What did they find in the vehicle? We wouldn't expect any of that to be in here because they put all this information in here prior to arresting him and getting the vehicle and able to search the vehicle. So we can't be surprised that we don't see, you know, blood in the, in the vehicle, victim's blood, murder weapon, whatever it may be. Um, so I do think though, the fact that he went there 12 times prior to uh, the day of the actual murder is going to be damning evidence against him because it definitely looks like he's stalking out and surveilling this place before committing the crime. Trevor Davis, thanks for this uh, super chat. Midnight Rider and Brian Land are also two new members. EJ, love the diplomatic point of view. Helps to see all sides and not assume guilt. The mainstream media is, conv is convicting him already. Look forward to all your lives. Thank you, EJ. And I know that sometimes talking about it this way and having um, this perspective can also be demonized. If any of you guys have this perspective when you talk to people, I, I know it happens sometimes in our chat and I totally understand it because people feel for the victims and they want justice for the victims. Um, but I think this is the appropriate way legally to look at it. So that's the way that I look at it. And I know that it's not, I know that it's not always easy to hear. So I appreciate you guys also being um, understanding with that. Uh, Brian land. Thank you for the super sticker. And then here, Brian saying, I need help with my a case of my own lawyer, you know, at gmail.com real lawyer, practicing personal injury, wrongful death cases, catastrophic injury, car accidents, uh, trip and fall cases. If you have a case like that, reach out. Uh, my dad handles all of our criminal defense in our firm as well. And, you know, but if I can try to connect you with somebody in a, you know, different area, um, different state, I will always try to do that. I respond to as many as I can, try to help as many people as I absolutely possibly could. Um, if I don't respond right away, sometimes I'll reach out to somebody in another state and they won't get back to me. And so sometimes there are delays, but I do my best, I promise. And I appreciate everybody on YouTube that calls me for help and we end up working together. It is a relationship unlike any other um, because we have this kind of like bond, already know each other, know how we, how we think and know what to expect when you hire our firm. So uh, Brian, if I can't help you, please email me. Carolyn Layton is a new member with Amanda E and Alexandra Hernandez. Uh, Sandra Ramirez, as a defense attorney, would you start thinking plea deal after reading this or wait till discovery? I would definitely wait till discovery. If he's telling me he didn't do it, right? I mean, you gotta, you gotta come into it. If he's saying, no way, this isn't me, I wasn't there, or my brother had my car or my friend or my roommate had my phone or I was dating one of these victims or whatever, you, you, we don't know what he's saying at this point. So that's, that's difficult. Uh, Jacqueline Weaver, thank you for the super sticker. Uh, Kit Kat 78 regarding the roommate, if you are intoxicated, a 19 year old who is used to strangers coming in and getting in, going at all times, you hear some noises, see a guy leave, get scared. Then you convince yourself that you're being silly. Kit Kat, totally plausible explanation. And if this is what she says, I think we say, okay. And we understand none of this is her fault at all. I want to be clear about that. Nobody thinks any of this is her fault. It's just whether or not her testimony is going to be the smoking gun that I think it could be um, when we talk about how 
you build a case like this um, and get to uh, evidence that proves this case beyond a reasonable doubt. Sarah Bellum, thank you so much. I'm going to pull this uh, tracker off. We hit that 170, which is crazy awesome. Um, and I'm already, so we've had some back orders on the stuff we were giving away for 150. I, I don't think we've gotten that out yet. Those are still coming. So apologies. The next giveaway we have will be something that we already have here. We can send directly to you. So I apologize for that. Thank you, Sarah Bellum. Heidi, thank you for this super sticker as well. Brandy Moore, trying to understand the verbiage. The wounds on these victims are worded in different ways. They all don't say stab wounds. Some say edge weapon and sharp force injury. Does this all mean the same? It could mean different. Could mean cuts. I don't want to get into too much gory details. It could mean cuts, slices, stabs. There's different ways that a, an edge weapon can, whoops, can cause these. All right. Uh, Mr. RN, what holes or weaknesses do you see in the case against BK? Would you represent him? Um, if he told me he didn't, I mean, I, I really don't like doing criminal defense anymore, so I really don't do a lot of it if I'm being honest. So probably not. Um, I'd be much more likely to represent the victims in cases like this. Um, but the holes would be the eyewitness credibility. We will see how that goes. Um, the connection or lack thereof, the amount of other people that match the description that was given, the amount of other people that have white Elantras, the amount of other reasons he could have driving to Idaho. From what I hear from everybody in this chat that lives over there, it's not uncommon to go back and forth from Washington state to Idaho. Even law enforcement has said that. Um, so there could be a million reasons he was in that area and not this. Um, the DNA on the sheath to me is the, the toughest one to get over. It's the toughest one to get over. Cindy Sturmill. 23 and me and ancestry do not cooperate with police FBI in regards to using suspects DNA against their databases. I have seen cases where that has been subpoenaed and it doesn't always go their way. John O'Rourke, how'd he get in? We want more. Thanks to the legal point of view. Yeah, there's definitely facts that we don't know yet that we are still waiting to hear. Michelle M. DM could have been scared and kept silent thinking the person will come back after. Absolutely. I agree with you. Absolutely. Now, if that's her answer, and I'm the defense attorney, I know which people are going to hate this question, but for eight hours, like when did you think when you were balancing fear and my roommate's safety, and it's not like she called 911 and they're not knowing what happened, right? I believe, and again, some people are saying she did call 911 right away. So there's more details that I'm waiting to see. And that's something I asked JB and Josh on their show today on WFLA is you guys are the reporters is that confirmed? And they said it was confirmed. So I'm not, I'm not hundred percent positive. Um, but I do think there's going to be a question is, and it wasn't like eight hours later, you just called 9 one cause you were still so scared. They actually went up and looked and then found them non-responsive, which is also a weird description, right? Finding them non-responsive as if like, maybe they were still, I, I don't know, some weird stuff still around the whole reporting of it. Ryan Waters, a strange loop. He took after the crime scene back to his house. Yeah. Proper, possible area where he got rid of the knife dm saw suspect at 4 a.m why the 11 911 call i know that's a big question and again if they have that loop and they know exactly where he drove i assume they've searched all those areas for the murder weapon and couldn't find it nala hey you finally caught a, caught you live been watching regularly from australia though awesome nala thank you so much azam thank you so much for the super sticker now they'll be able to get his dna and commit to the sheath Yes. Now they'll be able to get his DNA and it'll probably be even more of a match here that'll lock in and get even better expert testimony, I would think. Kim Bryan is a new member. Azam, start watching this from dark time until the sun comes up, LOL. Good Friday morning from Malaysia. Uh, thanks for the overtime, Peter. Congrats on 170K. Thank you so much, Azam. Appreciate you always being here. Ashley Marie is also a new member. Welcome, Ashley. Man, my mouth is dry after all this talking. All right, a couple more questions and then we're going to call it. Be kind. Her testimony could also give the physical description as bushy eyebrows or could this put doubt in there being only one perpetrator? Lots of evidence though. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons law enforcement is probably confident because she saw one person walk down the stairs and walk out, right? Her testimony is a big piece to me to understand why they went in certain directions in the investigation. Uh, Bobby XO. 
And what type of situation would prosecutors file a victim's right notification form? Just wondering, as there is one filed on the court doc website, naming the roommate that saw BK that night. Thank you for all you do. So I don't know. Every jurisdiction is probably a little bit different. What this sounds like it might be to me is they may be adding that, you know, witness or roommate as a victim in the case. I'm not sure. And they may be adding her as a victim in the case, but I'm not sure. Affidavit is strong. Is it watertight? I would say not yet, but it is strong. And it's definitely more than enough for as a probable cause affidavit. Bug love. I mod for JBWFLA and saw you there. Thank you for covering this. Thank you, bug love. Thanks for coming here too. Lita Randolph, a stalwart always here. Thank you, Lita for another super sticker. Uh, Carrie Sutton, 16 minutes to commit the crime. Plausible. You know what, Carrie? It's a great question. To commit this type of crime in 16 minutes. Will we find out he's got some kind of training, the USMC stuff? Like, are we going to find out more stuff? I don't know. This that's, that's a good question. I think it's definitely something to add context to how all this happened. Ashley Marie, thanks for the super sticker. P-Hop. Uh, welcome to all the new members. You are now a part of the best channel and the best chat. It's definitely the best chat. I appreciate that so much. You guys are awesome in there, respectful. A lot of different points of views without, we, we argue, but respectfully, right? Without fighting, without being nasty, without hating on each other for thinking differently because that's what that's how we learn more. Uh, thank you so much, Janelle. Um, he has martial arts training. He wanted to be an army ranger. He wanted to be in law enforcement. People are saying, yeah, uh, he's a kickboxer. Some people are saying, Greeting from Boise, a Boise. Greetings from Boise. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, and Haley is also a new member. So welcome to all the new members. Um, and we've got some membership content uh, planned in the future. So I appreciate all that. He's a black belt, people are saying. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Haley and old man. We love the old man. And Sarah Hewer, thank you so much. All right. We are going to have to call it. Uh, I appreciate you guys so much. Barbara, we love you too. Um, from low, from Northern Lower Michigan. Good golf in Michigan. I was there this summer playing. So I appreciate everybody. This was so awesome. Hopefully you guys come back. We're going to talk more about this tomorrow. We're going to talk about that stop in Indiana. If any rights were potentially violated, um, I'm going to go off on these. Sharon Sullivan, thank you so much uh, for the breakdown. I've been waiting for this all day, Sharon. And I know I've been sta I was stacked with appointments until four o'clock today. I squeezed JB in uh, for 15 minutes. Um, so it was even more of a delay than I wanted, but you guys showed up and brought the questions that made it even more interesting. Uh, and Mickey Duff, thanks for this super sticker. Uh, we will go out on this. You guys are the best. Again, we'll talk more tomorrow. Make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss future lives because this is where it happens. If you're part of the Rewatch crew, get in the comments and let me know your questions. All right, see you guys next time.